Hey folks, thanks for being here. This is episode 75 of Elk Talk Live, brought to you by Botech as one of the companies. And get this out of the way right now, Botech is having a sweepstakes where some lucky winner is going to get the chance to go on a whitetail hunt at the Grigsby Farm in Illinois. All you gotta do is text Newberg, N-E-W-B-E-R-G, to 64600, and you might be the lucky winner. It doesn't cost you anything. And you get your chance to maybe go on a whitetail hunt that you probably would never get a chance to otherwise go on. And then we got Leupold. Thank you. And then we have Onyx Maps. Thanks to them. And use promo code Randy and save 20%. And right now, you hear us talk about Go Hunt during the application season, right? They have this insider service. Well, here's how you get a 30-day free trial. Go to gohunt.com slash, like forward slash. Well, maybe on the screen it's a backward slash, but it it's the forward slash on your keyboard. So gohunt.com forward slash Randy, and you get a 30-day free trial. And if you say, hey, this stuff is so good, I just want to sign up, use promo code Randy and save 50 bucks when you sign up, or save 50 bucks by getting $50 of store credit. Uh, let's see, Rocky Mountain Hunting Calls. Go to RockyMountainHuntingCalls.com, save 15% uh, by using promo code Randy. Uh, did I say on X, it gives you 20% off if you use promo code Randy? If I didn't, I said it again. Uh, and then we got tight spot quivers, ripcord rests, and black gold sights. With all that, uh, we're gonna start answering questions. Dan's already on, uh, this is the part that I would, okay, there we go. Sometimes like I hang up accidentally. Um, let's see, what hunts are on the filming calendar this season? Oh my goodness, it's a crazy season. We're gonna be hunting elk multiple times in Montana. Who all has Montana elk tags, Dan? Marcus, Michael, me, Dale, Corey Jacobson, Donnie, uh, Matt Seidel, Andrew, and Carson from Gerber. I might be missing somebody. And then me, let's see, for Wyoming, it's me and Michael. Uh, in Nevada, my buddy Scott Jones. In New Mexico, my Uncle Mike. So that's just the elk part of it. And then we've got deer in Arizona, uh, deer in Wyoming, deer in Montana, deer in Nevada, antelope in Nevada. A friend of ours is going to be hunting that. Mm, yeah, busy year. So, oh gosh, hopefully that answers that question. Um, <laughs> watching Newberg and Monday Night Raw. Something tells me Monday Night Raw has probably got a little more entertainment factor going than what I've got. So Dan loaned me his, his phone here. Uh, I guess this is, this is for Instagram over here. Uh, it's so small that I can hardly read it. <laughs> Whoa. This question gets asked all the time. What's the best all around cartridge for elk? Uh, the one you shoot the best. The one that shoots the most accurately for you is what I usually say. There's, you know, anything probably from a 25 caliber on up is a good elk cartridge. Just make sure you have premium bullets, that you know what that bullet is doing, that you have a really good scope. Like, you know, I don't have one with me here, but, you know, we use these gold rings from Leupold. Uh, and you'll be set. Hey, People spend way, way too much time uh, arguing about these cartridge little variations. Just go hunting. What you have is probably going to do the trick. Um, do you guys have bow or rifle tags in Nevada this season? I don't have it. My buddy Scott Jones has an archery tag for elk this season. Um, <laughs> uh, Randy, what about a hot Utah archery hunt? Any tips for hot temps? Yeah, make sure you're out there right at, I mean, the absolute first crack of legal shooting light and be there absolutely, you know, hunt right up till that dark period because if it's super hot, 
They're not going to be moving much. And if you can, instead of going back to camp and taking a nap, find some water place to set up. And a lot of times those elk are going to come in in the middle of the day to water. So can't chew one back at camp. Well, I guess maybe you could, but it doesn't happen very often, I don't think. Uh, let's see. What does that say? What trekking poles do you use? What features do you look for? Um, I have multiple brands of trekking poles. I've tried all kinds of them. Probably the ones I end up going with are they're Lecky, L-E-K-I. And I like the binder clip ones. I don't like the twist grips. I like the cork light handles. Uh, you get a bad formed handle or a handle that's got some contour to it. And after the course of a few days, it's rubbing on the palm of your hand. Um, it, it's just a pain. So that's what I end up using, but there's tons of good ones out there. I get the collapsible ones. So a lot of times when we're archery hunting, I'll have them stuffed in the side of my pack. And then when we're rocking out at night or if we got an elk, I can extend them and off I go. So, uh, no Utah this year. No, no Utah this year. Um, have I ever applied for a Kentucky elk tag? Yep. I've applied for lots of Kentucky elk tags, but so far Kentucky's not found me worthy of receiving one. So, uh, let's see. What is your go-to during the day for nutrition sources? Do you live off granola bars or you take a full mountain house type meal for the day? That depends on the time of year. If it's cold out, I will pack a whole mountain house out there because I'm wanting that warmth that comes with it and I'm burning a lot, lot of calories just trying to stay warm. Uh, during the day, uh, I'm usually gonna have some sort of meat, uh, like a jerky, uh, meat sticks, something like that. And then I'm really big into the proteins from nuts. I, I don't know how many cashews I eat in a day. Uh, some dried fruit, I'm kind of a dried mango guy. And I, I usually get by on that. I'm not real big on the granola bars. I'll, I'll eat one if I have to, but uh, they're not high on my list. Um, let's see. So any advice for a bull elk tag in Nevada, unit 72 through 74? I've not hunted elk there. Uh, all I would say is it's a wilderness area, um, primarily, but those elk migrate from Nevada over towards Jackpot or, or from the Jawbird, and then they migrate north into Idaho. Uh, if you have one of the late seasons, I'd be trying to figure out where are those sanctuary places on their migration route that the bulls are going to hang out because the bulls are going to come last. The cows and younger bulls are already going to do their migration. If you got weather, come back up the migration corridors and look in those sanctuary areas, that's probably where you're gonna see those older bulls. And they're gonna be in bachelor groups if you have that November tag, no doubt about it. Uh, let's see, come hunt in Oregon. Uh, I'm gonna get there someday. I got people really giving me a lot of intel about uh, Columbia Blacktail and Roosevelt Elk. I'll, I'll be there sooner rather than later, I would just about bet. Um, man, there's a lot of people on here today. Um, what gold ring loophole scope do you use for a 308 if you're shooting 400 plus yards? Uh, it depends on what your budget is. Uh, on my three, I have multiple 308s. Uh, they one carries a VX6 and the rest of them have VX5, both HDs. Uh, and again, that gets to what do you want for your magnification? What do you want for your objective lens? It's, you know, a lot of my 308s, they're a short action cartridge. So I want a more compact rifle and I'm thinking, wait, wait, wait. You know, I, I, I'm conscious about what it weighs. So in those instances, I carry a pretty small compact scope on my short 20 inch barrel 308. Uh, on the one I have a VX6, uh, two to 12 and never have felt like I was missing out on anything. So, uh, let's see, is a 130 grain Nosler Acubon for a 270 good or is there something better out there? 
if there's something better out there, I don't know what it is. I would go with that if I was you. Uh, a lot of people ask me, well, is the 270 enough gun? The first five bull elk I killed was with the 270, and all of them had 150 grain nozzler partition in it. And they were like, take two steps and tip over type shots. So uh, a 270 is slam dunk. You're gonna, don't worry about it. Put the bullet in the right place and have high quality bullets. I, I know a lot of people hear me talk about that, but I can't overemphasize the importance of a high quality performance bullet. You see what I use? I use nozzlers. Uh, sometimes I use their E-tip, which is a non-lead bullet. Sometimes I use Acubones and sometimes I use uh, partitions. So, uh, oh, I don't know how many of you are members of the Elk Foundation, but dang it, I forgot to bring it again, Dan. There's a, there's a deal going on with the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation right now that if you sign up to be a member and you got to use this link, it's uh, rmaf.org forward slash Gerber. $35 membership, you get a $40 Gerber Vital Knife for signing up. So there, you make five bucks by signing up to be an RMEF member. And in the process, you're helping elk, you're helping access, you're helping conservation. Uh, I think somewhere Dan has a link. I just uh, oh, Dan just put it on, on the YouTube or the Facebook uh, feed here. Uh, let's see. <laughs> a lot of invitations to come and film stuff. If people knew how bad we will mess up your hunt if we are there, you, you'd be like, mm, no, don't, please don't show up. <laughs> There's a reason that mostly only family and friends hang out with us for more than once because it's quite an encumbrance to everything. Um, let's see. A buddy and I are hunting over-the-counter archery mule deer in Arizona in the Flagstaff area in January. Any advice? Um, I don't have any advice. I'm sorry about that. I, I've i never hunted the mule deer on the over-the-counter hunt in, in January. So I'd, uh, I, I'd just be making it up. So <laughs> I guess I could make it up. My wife said I make it up most of the time anyhow. Uh, when you are not hunting, what do you do in your spare time? Uh, I try to pay my bills by being an accountant. Uh, I'm a tax accountant by trade. Uh, so I do a little bit of that. My wife is a fanatic walleye angler. So in the summertime, I do some of that. Um, and other than that, I mostly just work and volunteer for conservation stuff. And that's it. <laughs> uh, Jim Dye says, what backpack for a nine day trip? Easy answer. Mystery Ranch Bear Tooth 80. Uh, and if you don't think that's got enough volume, uh, step up to a Mystery Ranch Marshal. Uh, I did a 10 day trip in Alaska with a Bear Tooth 80 and it's an amazing pack. Um, let's see. <laughs> Boy, there's so many questions here. They're going by faster than I can read them. Let's see. Have I ever been wild pig hunting? I have not been wild pig hunting. Um, I don't know that I'll ever get wild pig hunting. It, it sounds like something that would be fun. I, I watch people do it, and it seems like it'd be a ton of fun. All right, here was one. Uh, where'd it go? Uh, no, I missed it. Uh, what kind of bow do I have? All right, I get this question a lot. Bear with me. Right here. <clears throat> okay, the Bowtech Realm. Uh, I have this one set up for here at the shop when we're doing demo stuff. Uh, that one right there, shot a bison in Utah last year. And then Dan even filmed that right over the shoulder, huh, Dan? Heck yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I wouldn't have shot it if it wasn't for Dan because he saw him coming towards us. I'm just trucking up the hill thinking, we got to get up there. Dan's like, hey, I think there's a bison up there. <laughs> uh, and then I have, let's see, an SS and a SR6. So that's what I have. Um, am I hunting New Mexico this year? No, I'm not hunting New Mexico. My Uncle Mike is. Um, and he'll... Uh, He'll have a ton of fun. When you guys get to meet my Uncle Mike, it's Le my Uncle Larry's brother. Oh my gosh. Uh, <laughs> if we ever had those two together, it'd be 
It'd be on the Comedy Channel, no doubt about it. What brand of elk calls do I prefer? Rocky Mountain hunting calls. Uh, if you go out there, use promo code Randy and save some money. Um, I'm trying to bounce around here between Instagram, Facebook, everything. Oh, this is a good question. I don't know that I have an answer. What's the best state to get the over-the-counter elk tag? So, we need to talk about that. I'm glad that he brought it up because right now all the draws are done. Other than there's a second draw for uh, tags that didn't get claimed in Idaho. That draw will be sometime like, I think the deadline will be August 10th or something like that. But other than that, you're, if you're going elk hunting this year and you haven't drawn a tag in one of the limited entry units or you don't live in a state where you can just go buy a tag, you got a few options. There's some in Oregon that are over the counter. Um, Colorado has a lot of over the counter for second and third rifle and for some of the archery. Uh, Idaho has these first come first served. I, I, I checked. When did I check? Sometime over the weekend anyhow, and they still had a lot of tags left. Uh, Montana has an alternate list that I think those will go on sale August 5th, 6th, something like that. And then Utah has over the counter, but most of the Utah over the counter ones are, are, uh, spike only. Um, not all, but, but most that I'm aware of. So if you're going elk hunting this year, those are your options. And back to the person's question of, if you're going to do over the counter, what state would you go to? Uh, I go to Colorado for over the counter. Colorado has the largest elk herd in the country, has just over, almost 23 million acres of BLM and state land. And there's just a lot of elk there. And the other cool part, <clears throat> so I go to these little towns in Colorado. I love it when you drive into town and the gas station says, welcome hunters. Every bar is like, hunters, come and eat here. Hunter special, blah, blah, blah. I don't know. Maybe I'm nostalgic, but it's those kind of places are always fun for me. I love going to those kind of places. Uh, someone had a question here. Thoughts on the 7M M08 for a 13-year-old's first all-around rifle for elk or deer? Yep. Great choice. Absolutely a great choice. Again, if you're going to shoot, uh, step up to a, a premium bullet. Uh, I shoot 140 grain Acubons and 140 grain E-tips out of my 7M M08s. Uh, I really like 7M M08. I have four of them. Uh, so, yeah, I... That's a great selection if, if that's what you're looking for. Um, let's see. Did I draw any super tags in Montana? No, I didn't even apply. Uh, I didn't apply for super tags in Wyoming. I didn't apply for super tags in any state this year, I don't think. Uh, uh, let's see. Am I hunting Nevada? I have an archery mule deer tag in Nevada, so I'll be down there in August, and it's going to be miserable hot. It always is. Uh, Sika is sending me some updates to my gear package. They, they make this really great ascent system and I use it and it's really great in hot weather, but they're sending me some new stuff. Oh, you gotta try this. So I'm a little bit excited to see what they're gonna send me, but uh, it'll be hot in Nevada. That's, I, I can't promise you I'll get a deer, but I can promise you I'll be sweating and hiking and sweating and hiking and sweating. Um, but let's see. Bunch of people said, oh, I already got my Gerber from RMEF. Cool. Uh, very good. Let's see. Someone asks, is the Mystery, Mystery Ranch Pop-Up 18 a good pack for a young hunter? Yes. And is it adjustable enough for an adult? Yes. So, depending on what the waist size of the young hunter is, you might not be able to find a waist belt that the young hunter has that will also be able to say, oh, here, you know, parent, use this pack. Uh, you'll need to test those waist sizes. Now, if you're thinking of buying two of them, one for the youth hunter and one for the parent, problem solved. Um, uh, is your wife hunting for mule deer this year? No, nope, my wife is not. Will I be at the Big Sky Total Archery Challenge in a couple weeks? Yep. I'm going to be there, and here's the deal. At, uh, Gerber gave us a thousand knives for this RMEF gig, right? Well... We're getting close to having run out. Imagine that, huh? A thousand new RMEF members. How cool is that? Uh, but at Total Archery Challenge, if you show up 
at the RMEF booth. I'm going to be there giving away a Gerber knife if you sign up as a member. And Leupold's buying dilly bars till we run out of Gerber knives. So you, you can't hardly beat a deal like that. Uh, I hope I see you there. Um, uh, let's see. A lot of guys having their own conversation here. Sometimes that's really good because they're answering each each other's questions and then I don't have to make something up. <laughs> that gives everyone a load of confidence when I say, oh yeah, I just make that up. Uh, let's see. Any elk, ooh, what was that one? Any tips for hunting elk in the east? I wish I did. I, wish, I, I can't tell you that elk behave the same or differently in the east. I, I wish I'd draw a Kentucky tag, then I could speak from experience. But right now, I again, I'd just be making it up. So I, I suspect same animal. They got relocated there from the West. Uh, I suspect they're going to have a lot of the same habits. You know, same certain times of the year, they're going to be behaving the same way. So uh, I hope that's the case. But I, I can't say that with 100% certainty. Uh, what was that one? Have I ever archery hunted Idaho for elk? No, I haven't. Uh, we keep saying we're going to do that some year, but we always swing for the fences in the Idaho draws and we never get the tag. Um, uh, let's see. No, I've never done that. I just bought my Montana bonus point for elk. Is there any reason to pick up a preference point as well? Um, in past years, I would have said, no, don't worry about the preference point. But this year, a lot of people who didn't have a preference point didn't draw the combo license. So those who had the preference point had 100% draw. So it's up to you. Do you want to spend, I think in non-residents, you guys get charged 50 bucks, something like that. So if it's worth the money, it's definitely like having insurance that you're going to probably get your Montana combo tag next year. Um... Oh, how accurate are the migration corridors in Colorado? I think you're referring to the Colorado Parks and Web Parks and Wildlife website. Uh, I think they're pretty accurate, at least in the units I've hunted. Um, those people put a lot of work into that, and it's it's uh, good. Uh, at, at least in in my experience. Now, someone might say, "Oh no, that doesn't blah blah blah," but we've encountered a lot of elk in those over-the-counter units and so if you think about the migration corridors on that map right so you got summer range up here you got the winter range down here and there's corridors the elk use to get from their summer range to their winter range well everything in between we call transition ranges now the cows and the younger bulls are going to drop down that transition range first and it's going to take a lot of weather in those Colorado seasons to get them way down to the winter range because Colorado ends their seasons earlier, specifically the over-the-counter seasons. So you're going to be looking for those bulls higher up near where the transition range meets the summer range. If you get a ton of snow, the bulls will be a little further down. Very seldom, unless hunting pressure has pushed them to private, are you going to find the elk down, the bulls down on the winter range in these Colorado rifle hunts. Now, you got to dissect that a little further. You got these migration corridors, and it's not like they're a straight corridor, like a hallway. They're, they do this based on geography, based on cover, based on what their patterns are. So I hunt those migration corridor areas, and sometimes they're pretty wide. If you look on those maps, it's like, well, that's a five mile wide migration corridor. Uh, sometimes they're pretty narrow. And I'm hunting those migration areas further up the transition range. That's how we approach it when we do one of the Colorado over-the-counter hunts. Um, someone's asking how my Uncle Larry's doing. Uh, I think he's doing well. Haven't talked to him for a while. Uh, he had a heart attack in April, uh, but they put a stent in, and he says he's just, just stomping and kicking and dancing and shucking and everything else. So he claims he's going to Wyoming on his elk hunt this year. Uh, I sure hope so. Uh, he's, he's so much fun. Just a ton of fun. Uh, all right. Dan, I'm telling you, you need a bigger screen on this phone here. What's it going to take to get you into a screen that I can read? 
what's that? A Christmas bonus. A Christmas bonus. There you go. Let's see. Any tips for new hunters on a smaller budget, like the main pieces of gear or equipment to get? Someone asked that question last week. And I would say that, first of all, think about if you see us in video, okay? It's taken me 30 years of, of Western hunting to kind of sort out my gear. And if you look at a bag dump we do, there's so many things in there. I don't have a relationship with any of those companies. It's just, this works and this is what I use. Now, someone else, if they dumped out their bag who'd been hunting 30 years, they might come to a different conclusion than I did. There's no right, there's no wrong. The point of it is, back when I just got out of college, I had a truck payment, I had student loans, I was trying to save money for a house, I just got married, I just had, my wife had just had our, our son, I didn't have money for gear. I was out there cannibalizing anything else I had. I had a book bag from college that was kind of my backpack on some hunts. I was wearing old wool pants from when I was logging in Minnesota. I had old chopper mitts that were, probably got them in eighth grade. So my point is I had to allocate my budget to tags and getting to the hunting grounds. As I got older, as I, my budget changed a little bit, I started upgrading. The first things I started upgrading were boots, uh, a backpack. Uh, I figured out, hey, you know what? In the mountains, layering systems are really important. Started upgrading that. Upgraded my binoculars. Um, I'm sure I'm missing some things, but those are kind of the basics I started with as I started investing. I called it an investment. So this is an accountant problem. Money out the door falls in one of two categories. That money out the door is either an expense that you're just going to keep recurring every so often, or it's an investment that you're going to incur once, but it's going to help you for a long period of time. Cheap gear is an expense. Quality gear is an investment. And just think about, okay, I'm going to try to build that investment of gear over time. And someday you'll have the gear that you need or... Someday you'll get to a point in your life where it's like, oh, I, you know, I got a little more disposable money and that's the time. Um, uh, <laughs> someone says I'm way too old to hunt in Reagan's Idaho. I would agree with you. Uh, all right, Dan, I did something here to your phone. I don't know what it is, but I'll figure it out. Uh, let's see. Um, it, is there a way to get the Gerber knife for signing up to RMEF if you aren't going to the Total Archery Challenge? Yep. So you got to use this URL. It's rmef.org forward slash Gerber. And there you go. Oh, uh, let's see. <laughs> uh, uh, so David says, Hey Randy, would you tell my wife what good it would do to drive out and scout six weeks ahead of the season? She just asked me why I wanted to go. David, I have some bad news for you. I'm not going to encourage you to do that. I'm going to encourage you to come out four days early before your hunt rather than drive out now. Uh, you'll get more value out of your time and your investment. The closer you can scout to when your season starts, the way more valid that information is. So, sorry, David, I know you were counting on me to deliver and, and give the, the, the punch, but I didn't. Sorry about that. It's kind of like people used to come to my CPA office and the guy would be bringing his soon-to-be wife and like, tell her, show her how it's best for us to get married. Uh, usually, if you're both earning a decent income, you're going to pay more in tax if you get married. And that, that's not a statement about marriage. It was just people used to come and ask me to do that. I'm like, hey, buddy, I'm sorry. By the time I'm done here, she's going to run away from the altar and you're going to have to chase her down again. Uh, is a 300 wind mag overkill for elk and black bear? Nope, not at all. Shot a lot of elk with a 300 wind mag. I've shot black bear with 300 wind mag. Uh, don't worry about it. 
Uh, someone says, gee, Randy, with an answer like that, you'd be a terrible wingman. <laughs> uh, yeah, I would be. I'm too honest to be a, a bought and paid for wingman. So, uh, so people keep asking, when are you coming to do a Pennsylvania elk hunt? I, I'd love to, but I'm not sure if anybody realizes just how difficult it is to draw a tag in Pennsylvania. So... Uh, you tell them to give me a tag, I'll be there. Man, I'll be there. Uh, I'll be there like a fire on a hay bale, man. Oh, you wouldn't be able to get me out of there if you gave me an elk tag. Uh, so, in my opinion, it's always questionable when someone says, in my opinion, what or what does science say? Do elk scents, deer scents, urine, and licks, where legal, contribute to CWD? I don't know. I really don't know. What we do know is that uh, concentrations of elk or deer, any cervid that could be subject to CWD, concentrations of them where they're exchanging fluids or otherwise, they believe that is one of the contributing factors. And so there's a possibility that that could happen with all of these scents and urines and stuff. That's why a lot of states are outlawing them. Um, I know that's a whole nother argument. People are going to have this opinion or that opinion, and that's fine. I would rather err on the side of caution. I look at just Montana in the last two years has uh, had some cases of CWD. And it's already costing us a ton of money, and we're just like a microscopic little speck of CWD compared to some of the states like, I think, Wisconsin, how much they're spending on CWD, Michigan, uh, a lot of these states, they are really compromising their total uh, infrastructure for wildlife management just to handle CWD. So anything we can do that might reduce that, um, I, I'm in favor of it. Whether the science definitively says that or it's a likelihood, I sign me up. I'll do it. Did your son pull any tags this year? Nope, he hasn't. Uh, He's been dealing with health issues uh, all year. I've, I've spent 35 days out in Oregon with him this year, helping him through some of his health issues. So uh, he's not uh, been applying for tags. He's just been buying points this year. But next year, next year we're going to go do it. So archery hunting or rifle hunting, which is better? That's like the old Miller Lite commercial, less filling or taste great, right? It's whatever you got to tag for or whatever you enjoy doing. I I can't think one way or the other of what, what's the best. Um, all right. James is going to ask a question here. It's an accounting and tax question. And we hear about it all the time, right? You go to some fundraiser and some person raises their hand and they pay a ridiculous amount of money for a statewide auction permit. Right? And they say they get to write that off. That any CPA who you came and sat in their office and said, I just paid $100,000 for a statewide elk tag, I wanna write it off, that CPA would laugh you out of their office. And I read out on the internet, people say, oh, well, it's a tax write-off. It's a tax write-off until you get caught. <laughs> you, people would laugh out loud. An auditor would, <laughs> I, <laughs> I can't even imagine sitting across the table from an IRS auditor and say, yeah, my client deducted that $100,000 as a charitable donation. Uh, one, there's a lot of personal benefit. Two, you can't say it's more than the fair market value of just buy, getting a tag in the draw because you get a whole lot of other benefits. Usually you get to pick units, you get to the front of the line, you don't have to wait. There, there's all kinds of reasons why people are paying a lot more money. Well, those auctions establish what the fair market value is, and you only get to deduct anything over fair market value. So if the auction price that you pay is fair market value, you don't get a deduction. And I hear people say it, it's like, oh my goodness. Uh, oh well, I, I just saw that. So James, yeah, that's accounting 101. Uh, if you've bought one of those auction tags, <laughs> thinking you're gonna deduct it, I'm sorry to, to Bring, bring bad news to your home. Uh, <laughs> uh, let's see. 
How are the new Howa rifle models working out for you? Will there be a Newberg model? Shane, you must have got some insider information. They're supposed to be here this week. That's what we hear. Um, hopefully people will like them. Uh, and that's all I'm going to say about that. And tell what Forrest Gump puts that, and that's all I've got to say about that. Uh, otherwise, I'll say way too much, uh, and I'll get in trouble. Um... Uh, a lot of people having their own conversations in on here, which, like I said, I like, but then I jump in there and I kind of mess everything up because I'm halfway in the conversation and then I'm wrong. Uh, scent control, laughing out, out loud. There is no such a thing. Uh, Keith, I, I'm not sure where you're going with that, but I'll tell you where I go with it because I get asked it all the time. If you're hunting elk in the mountains and you think spraying down and all this stuff is going to make a difference, no. Uh, talk to just about any serious elk hunter and they're going to laugh about these spray down products and uh, whatever it might be. It's like, really? By the time I get the first 800 feet of vertical up that hill, I am sweating so bad and you got scent coming out your mouth, your nose, your ears. It, I, I, I don't get it. Maybe if you're in a tree stand, it works. I, I've never tried it, but I just... Can't see it working uh, in elk hunting. What Leupold rangefinder should I buy? I'd buy the 1600 or the 2500. Uh, I, I have a 1600, absolutely love it. Um, <laughs> uh, let's see. Boy, there's a lot of stuff going on here. What brand of safe do I have? Um, trying to remember. You think I would know it's got this great big wall. Uh, sign or brand on the door hmm can't remember sorry about that uh what kind of sleeping bag do you use for the back country okay it depends on the time of year uh if it's in november i'm using a synthetic uh i have a c to summit uh minus 15 or minus 20 synthetic bag if it's in september and i know it's going to be nice i'm usually carrying my 10 degree or 15 degree down bag I, I, I've got a problem with sleeping bags. If you come into my my uh, Randy room at home, there's sleeping bags hanging. I, don't ask me why. I just like if they're on sale, it's like, well, that's a really good price, and I got all these extra Cabela's points. Ah, I better buy that. So that's how I ended up with way, way too many sleeping bags. But the good part is, I got one for each time of year. And sometimes I use synthetic. Sometimes I use down. Um, uh, <laughs> someone says a big brown save. Uh, so Sean says, I have a 7mm Remington mag. What scope would you put on it? Uh, depends on what your budget is. Uh, it's hard to say, but the we've got... Dan, what would you put on a 7mm Remington Magnum? Uh, for a scope? Yeah, VX5, VX5 HD. Yeah, say VX5 HD. Probably uh, three to fifteen. There you go. That's that's probably what I do. Um, let's see, Randy, how's the conditioning going this year? Uh, it got off to a late start. If you watched our black bear hunt, uh, I got really sick. Ended up in the hospital for four days after that in and out uh doctors told me you're gonna have to take it easy for a month so i didn't start working out until july 1st so i'm only on like hike number seven right now and i'm paying for it <laughs> <I'm>, <laughs> it's gonna be tough i i'm trying to do you know how when the doctor finally gives you permission and you want to just go out and make up for lost time i'm trying not to do that i'm trying to be smart about it because i don't want to have another relapse and uh, so we'll uh, we'll see how it goes. I'll, I'll I'll make it. I might be dragging. I might be the last guy up the hill. I might have to sleep in one morning, but I'm gonna make it. I'm I'm definitely gonna make it. So uh, man, these come by so fast. I can't read them all. Do I do I use a rangefinder? Yep, I sure do. I have loop like I said earlier. Uh, I have uh, Leupold uh, 1600 TBR DNA 
Uh, love it. Okay. What question should I ask the biologist when I call or email? Um, that's a good question because we tell people, you know, these are a resource. So think if you were this biologist in charge of seven hunting units. And when the tag draw results came out, you came to work the next Tuesday and you had 400 calls. Yeah. Plus you had to get all your work done. That's crazy. So if you want to get value out of your very small window of time that they have to allocate to you, be prepared. Don't say, where should I go? I already have done your research. Know what the patterns are. Know what the terrain might be. Have a good anticipation of what the hunting pressure could be. We've done this whole series of e-scouting out on our YouTube channel. Go watch that. Kind of have those questions already cleared so that when you're talking to the biologist, you could say, you know, it looks like there's going to be a lot of hunting pressure over in this drainage, so I was thinking of going up there. Can you confirm, is, is, is that where the hunting pressure goes? They can tell you things like that. Or, hey, in an early winter, it looks like the elk would probably use this area. That makes sense. Uh, just have questions that are precise and show respect for their time by having these questions prepared. If you just say, hey, can you give me some starting points? They're going to give you the same starting point they gave to the previous 280 people who called. And you're going to show up there. There's going to be 280 other people in that same general area. <laughs> it just, I mean, you just got to think about it from their standpoint. They, they want to help, but what, what do you do? Uh, it's just nearly impossible to reply to as many questions as they get. Uh, let's see. Um, yeah, glass, glass, glass. I like that one. Um, Let's see. Have I ever archery hunted in Idaho elk? No, I haven't. Um, get a lot of Idaho questions, and unfortunately, we've never drawn any tags there. Uh, looks like a lot of guys drew this year based on these questions. Um, let's see. I'm trying to. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not going to answer that one. <laughs> What tag am I most excited for this year? Mm, probably my Wyoming deer tag. Took me 13 years of applying or flunking out. And finally, the 14th year I drew. Uh, when are new episodes coming to Amazon? Boy, I'd like to plug in tonight and see that it got approved. Dan's over there smiling because we were having this discussion this morning in our staff meeting. Uh, I, we're just waiting for Amazon to say, yep, and turn on the switch. There's already some out there waiting for them to say, here you go. Uh, so season seven. And I think in the queue, how many did you load up to YouTube today, Dan? Five, like six, six. six. So. so those six are also going to YouTube and Amazon. So there's six more in the queue as quick as it happens. So um, let's see. Llamas versus pack goats. Uh, I know you like llamas, but thoughts on goats. Just bought two and they're awesome. I know some people who have goats and they love them and they rant and rave about them. I've never used them. So I can't compare one versus the other. Uh, I can tell you that llamas, uh, my buddy Bo Beatty down there at uh, Wilderness Ridge Trail Llamas, uh, it's, it's a game saver for me. Uh, some of the places we're going to go this year, if we didn't have llamas, I wouldn't even think about going in there as old and cobbled up as I'm getting. Dan, do you, can you believe I'm going to be 55? Woofda. You hear him? Woofda. <laughs> uh, yeah. But, oh well. As long as they'll give me tags and I can get out of the truck in the morning, I'm going to keep doing it. Uh, it's fun. What are good elk hunts for kids 17 and under? Uh, any of them that aren't going to make that child think you just put them on the baton death march. Uh, make it fun for those younger hunters. If they shoot a cow, be all excited about it. If they shoot a spike, be all excited about it. And if they shoot a big bull, yeah, be all excited about that also. Um, I think 
New Mexico has the best youth hunts of any state out there. If you go and look at New Mexico's youth hunts, my, my nephew Cody had one in 2010. Oh man, it was such a, such, such a fun time. So, uh, Brian asked, have you ever used a drone in filming the show? Uh, we haven't. Uh, we've like, so you'll see some drone footage in certain places. This summer, we're out filming drone footage of stuff that you might see in the fall show, just for the beautiful landscape effects. Uh, we took a drone to Alaska. Uh, Marcus crashed one of them. Uh, it was the day before we were going to go out. He was trying to get some nice, beautiful coastline stuff. Kaboom. Uh, we did take one to a, on an Alaska bear hunt. And uh, the day before uh, we could hunt, because you can't hunt the day you fly, we went out and droned some shoreline then, but as far as while we're out hunting, we don't for a couple of reasons. One, uh, in a lot of states it's illegal uh, to use a drone. In for, even if you're just filming, if you're in the act of hunting, it's illegal. Uh, two, we just don't want people to think we're out there using drones as some scouting mechanism or something. And I agree with all those state laws that say drones are illegal during hunting season. I, I fully agree with that, even though right over here is a couple thousand dollar drone setup. Um, most of our droning is done uh, in, in the summer, in the late summer or early fall. And we'll send one of the crew out and just go drone some stuff today. Or sometimes we'll be out on the road and someone else will go a different direction and they'll be out droning stuff. I think when we film some of our conservation projects, we've done some droning then, but it's, it's a pretty heavy, ex pretty expensive investment we've made for what little we use it. Let's put it that way. Um, let's see. Uh, <laughs> uh, good to hear Dan still has his Minnesota accent. There you go, huh? <laughs> uh, how are you liking your 6.5 Creedmoor? I've got two of them. I'm about to have a third one. I like them. They're great. Uh, you know, if there's one benefit of what we do over here, let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. There's 19 firearms just right in that corner over there. And at home, I have even more than that. We get to pick and choose what we want to shoot that day or what we're going to do or what we're going to go experiment with. And, uh, the, the thing I, I can say today is you almost have to go out of your way to find bad gear. Uh, so I, the 6.5 Creedmoor, love it. I mean, it, when you're deer hunting, when you're antelope hunting, excellent. I'm going to be using one on my Arizona coos hunt. Now, would I use it for elk if it was the only rifle I had? Yeah, I'd go buy some premium bullets and I would use it for elk at certain distances at certain shot angles. Would it be my first choice for elk? No, not even close. But some people, they're going to use it for that. Um, so, hey Randy, did you end up hiring more people on your crew? Did we, Dan? I think so. We hired one, Dale. And I'm keeping all these resumes. Some of the people probably think I'm blowing them off. But I'm looking at all the stuff we have in front of us. It's like, could I hire a second person? <laughs> and Dan's probably thinking, where are we going to put them? <laughs> uh, let's see. And people ask this every year in archery season, Randy, do you use a fixed or mechanical broadhead? And what's your thoughts on some states not allowing mechanicals? Uh, I use a fixed and for elk, I have no problem with the state saying no mechanicals here. Uh, and I know that's going to get me flamed by a lot of people, but if you've ever seen some of the bad results mechanicals have on elk, you'd know why. Uh, and you think about, an elk is a huge animal. You're trying to penetrate way in there. You just get this much penetration and hit one lung, that elk's going to die. But that arrow goes in there and it's a cork and you're cutting up one lung, but they make it a mile and a half you're not gonna find that elk in a lot of elk country. Uh, a lot of that energy or some of that energy in a mechanical is spent deploying the blades. 
and it's one more piece of mechanical device that can go wrong. When you're talking big boned animals like elk, I don't have any problem with states saying, we're not gonna allow those here because our state is, uh, and I'm thinking of Idaho. Idaho is primarily an elk hunting state and they don't allow them. I'm, I'm good with that. Um, let's see, Randy, will you be at RMEF Park City this weekend? Yep, or this week, yep, I will. Um, uh, boy, these go past so fast, I can't read them all. Um, doing another hunt with my brother. No, my brother, I think he said, I don't ever want to be filmed again. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, I don't think he, he wants to, to go with. Um, let's see. A lot of questions about training. Uh, and we've talked about that before. My training regimen for me is I got a trail right about a mile from my house that goes all the way to Yellowstone Park. If I wanted to hike 80 miles, I could hike all the way to Yellowstone Park. So what I do, I put on my mystery ranch, start out with a certain amount of weight, and then every day I add another water bottle in there. So I'm building my weight over the summer. And if I want to really work on cardio, I just go at it faster. Uh, I go off trails, I go on trails. If I see rocks and stumps, I purposely try to walk through them because those are causing my ankles and my knees and everything else to move and, and shift and be unbalanced. And that's just building muscle, it's, uh, or at least toning muscle uh, and getting all of your tendons, ligaments, all your joints ready for that craziness of, of mountain hunting. Uh, when I come down the hill, Again, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. I'm not just, I don't like to just get on a trail and walk a, you know, wide, smoothed out trail. I don't feel like get as much out of it. So that's my training regimen. Uh, I know it's, I'm not a gym rat, never have been. Uh, it's what I do. And hopefully by the end of summer, now that I'm cleared to go back doing it, I'll be ready to go come first part of September. What pack am I using this year? Looking at all of our hunts, uh, I think I'm probably gonna continue to use my Mystery Ranch Metcalf. It is so versatile. Uh, it is, uh, it's, it's just great. So Jeff says, I'm electronically challenged. Where can I get some monkey see, monkey do help with Onyx? Go out to their website, Onyx, on their YouTube page. They answer every possible question you could have with Onyx. Uh, it's just, it's the place. They they have it. They they got it dialed in. Um, oh, let's see. Second season elk, Durango, Colorado. Thoughts? Uh, if that's what fits your calendar, go do it. Um, it's steep, it's really steep. And if you look at that herd in Southwest Colorado, the numbers aren't like they were 10, 15 years ago. It's one of those units in Colorado where numbers are not doing as well as they'd like. So, uh, and it gets a lot of hunting pressure. But if that's what fits and you gotta go do it, go do it and have fun. Uh, I like the third season versus the second season, but. Um, let's see. <laughs> uh, let's see. Hey, Randy, how about a little advice on camping distance from areas you plan to hunt? What if other, hunter, what if other hunters are camping near? Do you move to another area? Uh, I don't like to camp really close to where I'm going to be hunting because elk aren't everywhere out there. They're in pockets here and there for a reason. And if I go camp right next to them and I blow them out of there, now I've just ruined what I've spent most of my e-scouting doing, and that is finding elk. So I'm usually gonna camp at least a mile or more from where I think the elk are gonna be. Uh, just how I do it. And if there are other hunters there, you know what, it's public land. I guess if they beat me to the spot, I keep right on hiking or I hike back out of there and go to a different spot or I hang a right and go over that ridge into a couple different drainages and make the most of it. That's why if you look at our e-scouting series, we always have 
backups for general, you know, like, a, okay, I'm gonna, my primary area is this part of the unit, my backup area is this part of the unit, and maybe my third area is this part of the unit. And within each of my areas, I have, okay, spot A, B, C, D, E, F, G, in case I show up and there's someone on spot A, I gotta have a B, C, or D to go to. And I do that with all three of the areas. So if you go out to our uh, YouTube channel and look at the e-scouting videos, you'll see how we approach that. Um, okay, this is a good one. We're getting ready to shoot a video on this one. Uh, Randy, what process do you use for transporting your meat and head across state lines to avoid the possibility of spreading CWD and the possibility of violating a state law. The reason we're gonna do a video on that in the next couple weeks is so many people are ignoring this law, partly because lack of information, partly because some of the laws are new and they aren't even aware of it. Uh, but if you come from, say, my home state where I grew up in Minnesota, and you come out to Colorado deer hunting, and you shoot a deer in Colorado, you cannot bring any spinal material or that head back to Minnesota without either taking the skull cap off and getting rid of all brain matter or boiling that skull and getting rid of all the brain matter. How many times I see people driving across states, yeah, I shot this in wherever, uh, you're violating the law. And like uh, Bashir said, or Bashir, there's a, or yeah, However, sorry if I mispronounce that, uh, you are probably running a high risk of spreading CWD. If you're hunting a place that CWD is endemic, definitely Wyoming and Colorado are like some of the core areas of CWD concern, and you're taking that to Nevada, or you're taking that down to Texas, or you're taking that back to Michigan, you, one, you're violating the law. Two, you're probably increasing the risk of a transmission of CWD. So we're, we're telling people, you know what, when we're traveling, we're just going to start adding a boiling pot, a burner, and a propane tank as part of our, our gear. We've done multiple videos on this on our channel. You'll see that when Marcus and Dan were in Arizona last year and they shot a coos deer, they boiled the head. You'll see that when we were in Nevada one year, we went through the whole process, how we boiled three heads before we came home. We did a video about how in Wyoming last year, when my son shot an elk, we actually just did a skull cap because he's gonna get a full uh, shoulder mount. And we're talking about why we're doing this is CWD related. So we're gonna, we're gonna keep doing it. Uh, hopefully people start getting more and more information uh, and we can figure out some way to slow down the spread of CWD. I don't know what it's gonna be, uh, but we have to be thinking about it and doing what we can to reduce the likelihood of CWD spreading across the landscape. Uh, minimum draw weight for elk with your bow. Hmm. Well, that depends. You're, you're going to get a lot of different answers on that. Uh, some people will say 45 pounds. Some will say 50. I shoot 60 to 61 pounds. Uh, I'm sure you'd be safe at 50. How far down below that you'd go, I, I'm not an expert to say, but uh, obviously the number one thing is shot placement. Good shot selection, not too far out there. In a razor sharp broadhead. Absolutely razor sharp. Um, so what's the most danger you've ever been in in the back country? Hmm. I don't know. What would be the most danger I've ever had in the back country? Have any danger when you're, when we just about got flooded out in Utah this year? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I, I've never felt like I've been in any grave danger in the back country. Uh, many of you know I have a weird liver condition. There's been times where that's flared up and it's probably spooked my, my crew more than it has me. Uh, so... Maybe that's, uh, maybe, maybe those are the times where I would have to say that's the case. Oh, uh, you got any really good ones, Dan, as we're getting close to the end here? Some that we just got to do? Uh, Somebody's wondering when you're going to get out there and snag one of those paddle fish. Oh, when am I going paddle fishing? I was going to go this year, but 
I, I didn't draw the keeper tag like Michael did. I had a snagging tag like Marcus had. Uh, but I was in recovery mode when they were out uh, paddle fishing. So someday I'm going to go do it. Uh, I don't know when, but uh, someday. Um, let's see. Uh, what else are we thinking here? Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, when you use, when you boil these heads, do you use a degreaser? Yes. Uh, borax is a really good degreaser. There's, it's called 20 mule team borax. I don't know why he came up with that. Also Don, uh, uh, dish soap is a good degreaser. Uh, all those are, are very helpful. Um, but one thing we're noticing is that people must prefer watching this on Monday night versus Wednesday night because we get way more traffic on Monday night than we do Wednesday night. Uh, we want to make sure that you remember that you can win a sweepstakes for Bowtech. This, all you got to do is Dan's going to put the link in here or you can text Newberg, N-E-W-B-E-R-G, to the number 64600. And you might be the one chosen to go to the Grigsby uh, farm in Illinois, a Botex paying full freight, everything to get you there, the whole works. Uh, they're going to pick somebody. I don't know who it'll be, but uh, they're going to take you there on a whitetail hunt. Um, and then we have, let's see, we want to make sure that people also know about that Gerber deal with RMEF. Sign up for RMEF and get a Gerber knife. So $35 membership and you get a $40 knife from Gerber. How good is that? RMEF.org forward slash Gerber. Uh, and then 30 day free trial from uh, Go Hunt. Uh, go to GoHunt.com forward slash Randy. 30 day free trial. You, you wonder how we draw all these tags and how we do all of our research? This is your chance to get in on it. Uh, thanks to Botech, Leupold, uh, Ripcord, Tight Spot, Black Gold, Onyx, Go Hunt, Rocky Mountain Hunting Calls, all those. What else do we got to cover, Dan? Seems like there's got to be like some absolute premium question that, uh, that we got to do. Uh, do I cook elk tacos? In the backcountry, uh, we have tried, but with limited success. Um, let's see. <laughs> I'm sorry, David. The guy whose wife I said, or I told him, you don't, you don't ask me to tell your wife to go scouting. Uh, she likes me now. Okay. Well, I'm not sure if, the, <laughs> if she ever met me, she probably wouldn't. Uh, but. All right, this is one we get a lot, a lot. So this is a really good one uh, to cover. When hunting an area with the majority of our dark timber, what do you look for during e-scouting to determine a point of interest that might hold elk? First of all, if it's mostly dark timber, there's not much feed there. So if you say, I don't care, I'm hunting here anyhow, then you're going to have to hunt those places where that canopy is disrupted and that's where the feed's going to be. There's a reason why when you watch our content, you don't see us in dark timber very much. It, because elk are in there, but they're in there in very low densities relative to other places with better feed, with rougher terrain, with uh, just a whole multitude of other things that elk prefer. The, so let's say you have... Uh, a ridge here that rolls over and it's open here and then you got all this dark timber down there they're gonna bed right on the edge of that dark timber within a few hundred yards of where that feeding place is all that other dark timber is probably very very low elk density i don't want to say void of elk but very low densities and yeah sometimes when the shooting starts you'll get elk that for a couple days will go into dark timber and just like I'm hanging out here, man. <laughs> this is dangerous. But they can't hang out there for very long because they need food, and there's no food in that dark timber to speak of. There's a little bit maybe, but hardly any. So uh, two answers to that. One, if I'm resolving or if I've resolved I'm going to hunt this dark, big dark timber drainage, 
I got to find the disruptions to the canopy, uh, rock slides, avalanches, burns, uh, blowdowns, uh, maybe the edge where the beetle kill and the non-beetle kill come to each other. Those are the places that the elk are going to be. If that's where you're kind of locking yourself into. Me, I would look at that e-scouting and I'd be like, you know what? I'm going to go find a different area. I think the elk densities there are going to be very low. I want to hunt an area with higher elk densities. Higher elk densities, you got to have food. Uh, you got to have escape terrain if you're hunting the later seasons of the post rut or the late season. Now, if it's, uh, say, early season pre rut or peak rut, I know they're really going to be focused on food. The bulls are focused on food in the early season. And then the cows are focused on food in the pre-rut and the peak rut. And what are the bulls focused on? They're focused on the cows. And if the cows are focused on food, you're kind of hunting a food pattern in those first three seasons. Those first three seasons, I'm just finding where's the best food because that's where the cows are going to be. And I don't feel like I got to go 10 miles back. Now, as you get into the later seasons, and sanctuary is the primary need. Yeah, I got to find rougher country. I got to find where either distance or topography or blowdown or something keeps hunters from going in there. Those are the places I'm going to find bulls in those last two seasons of post rut and late season. But uh, uh, you're you're going to see bulls in dark timber. They're in there, but their densities are much lower than they are in a lot of other places. So. Uh, I know that helps. That's what we got for tonight. Um, let's see. Am I in town next Monday? I believe I am. I think we're going to do it again next Monday. Kyler will be running the shop. Give Dan and his, uh, his baby. How old is Grayson, Dan? He's almost five months. Almost five months. Dan's got a little boy that's almost five months old. So appreciate him filling in tonight. And uh, we'll get the rest of the crew here to actually do some work. I've been sloughing off fishing and everything else. So anyhow, thanks for watching. Thanks for all the companies that make this possible. Hope to see you next week.